Hi friends, quick trigger warning. If discussion of body image or eating disorders is a trigger, this might not be the episode for you right now. Today's guest is Professor Gemma Sharp. Gemma leads body image and eating disorders research in the Department of Neuroscience at Monash University. Body dysmorphic disorder focuses on a specific part of the body, maybe your nose, your hairline, your skin. This concern is so debilitating that it really has such negative impacts on the rest of your life. Maybe you won't even have dinner with your family members because you're so concerned about this particular appearance concern. In addition to studying body dysmorphic disorder and disordered eating, Gemma has also spent extensive time looking at psychological predictors and outcomes of male and female genital body image concerns and cosmetic genital surgery. The huge interest has been in those injectables, the Botox and the fillers, and just being able to get it at your like local shopping center. The accessibility is so high now that it's become rather mainstream. In this episode, you will learn what body dysmorphic disorder is, who it affects, what the major risk factors are, how body dysmorphic disorder can increase the risk of disordered eating, unhealthy exercise behaviors, and negative cosmetic intervention outcomes. Super important topic, and really the first time that we've covered it on this show. So consider this an introduction and we can dig deeper in future episodes. Please enjoy. Your CV, I must say, is off the charts. You have a huge number of degrees, awards, uh, research and clinical experience. And, you know, I am so impressed that by all that you've managed to achieve in such a, a short period of time, how would you briefly describe your career to someone, the things that you've done and, and what you've been interested in researching or thinking about so far? I think in one word, diverse. And certainly when I speak with students, I talk about it being non-linear. Seeing as I, I started out life as a biomedical scientist and, and now shifted to clinical psychology. So I, I suppose <laughs> I've been able to keep up a lot of really diverse interests. And, and I think in research, it's such an exciting career that you get to pursue things that you love and that will hopefully help people because of your clinical work. So, yeah, diverse, non-linear, and I suppose busy too, but I like to keep busy. And when did you begin getting interested in, in body dysmorphia and the psychology behind that? You know, people people will probably often think it's like, oh, you know, some lifelong ambition, but it it wasn't. I mean, obviously, you know, I have a body and I've been interested in my body and other people's bodies, but um, it was actually when I was uh, doing my master's, I uh, was able to chat with patients and these were breast cancer patients. I was lucky enough to, well, they would donate their samples and then I would go back and process it in the lab. And they would talk to me about their body image concerns in conjunction with their, their cancer diagnosis, because I think, um, breasts and women's, I suppose, these, I should say, predominantly female patients, uh, women's sense of femininity was quite tied up in their breasts and, and the removal was very concerning for them. And I was like, wow, isn't this really interesting? This interplay of oncology and body image. And so my very first body image projects were cancer prevention. So I did like a skin cancer prevention project by, and oh my gosh, just looking back how dodgy this technology was back in like 2012. It was like this AI showing people how they would age if they went out in the sun too much. And that was my very first project. But I, I just loved body image from then on. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. So we're on the same page because I... I, I think as this conversation unfolds, body image, body dys, dysmorphic disorder, some of these terms are going to keep coming up. By definition, what is body dysmorphic disorder and is it the same thing as having a negative body image? Great question. Thanks for asking me to clarify that. And I think we sort of throw these terms around quite interchangeably and, and they are quite different things. So so everyone has a sense of body image. It's our thoughts, feelings and behaviours related to our body. And sadly, having pretty negative thoughts, feelings and behaviours around our body is, is quite common. And so some people have called this a normative discontent, which which 
is is how we're sort of conceptualizing body image at the moment. Body dysmorphic disorder is a clinical disorder that we'll find in all of our psychiatry diagnostic manuals. And it's characterized by a couple of things, but obviously being very concerned about your appearance is a key factor. And generally it, it it focuses on a specific part of the body, maybe your nose, your hairline, your skin, something like that. This concern is so debilitating that it really has such negative impacts on the rest of your life. So maybe you might even be so concerned about others seeing you, you can't even leave your house. Maybe you won't even have dinner with your family members because you're so concerned about this particular um, appearance concern. So it is just, I mean, it's it's negative body image on steroids, really. It is just such a such a debilitating disorder and people will go to great lengths to to camouflage or engage in compulsive behaviors just to try and alleviate these concerns. I use the the term body dysmorphia. Is that is that synonymous with body dysmorphic disorder? It is, yeah, and I think because body dysmorphic disorder has, it's, it's um, I suppose, undergone its own kind of morphing uh, in our diagnostic manuals. And so the term we use most commonly now is body dysmorphic disorder. And how prevalent is this? So body dysmorphic disorder, we estimate as occurring in about 1% to 2% of the population. So that's, that's pretty high. And I actually think that's quite an underreport because... This is quite an understudied topic and and people are quite ashamed of it. And I think something that people might not be aware of is just that it seems to affect genders fairly similarly as opposed to, I say, maybe eating disorders, which is a little bit more female dominated, but body dysmorphic disorder seems to impact across the gender spectrum. And is it something that typically begins in early life, you know, in, in adolescence, or is it, is it also common for someone to kind of go through childhood and adolescence and have a very positive body image, but then develop body dysmorphic disorder later as an, as an adult? This, I think developing as an adult is a little bit less common. I can imagine though, I mean, there are certain times of life where our appearance can change quite radically. So they can be, I suppose, risk points. I'm thinking of things like say pregnancy and, and stuff like that where bodies change a lot. But generally speaking, uh, it is an adolescent onset for a body dysmorphic disorder. And I'm assuming there's been studies comparing populations across the world that live in different environments trying to tease out what are what are the risk factors for this condition? How much of it is our environment? Is, is a, a portion of it genetic? What do we kind of understand here? I wish I could tell everyone more, all your listeners, because I feel like at the moment we're very much in the dark about the etiology of um, of body dysmorphic disorder. We we know it can certainly run in families, so there is that genetic component, but there is also environment. And I do wonder, I mean, certainly there's been a lot more research in Western countries, but I, I have the assumption that body dysmorphic disorder is in other countries too, and we just haven't looked for it. Yeah, even the, the idea of it running in families, this is interesting, right? Because we often see various chronic diseases run in families, but families not only share the same genes or similar genes, but also often share the same lifestyles. So, so then it becomes a question as to, you know, why is it running in, in families? You headed up a project looking at the impacts of social media on body image. What were the, the kind of most interesting findings from this work? Obviously, social media has um, it's been with us a little while now, so the body of research has expanded quite a bit since our like earliest. I'm just thinking of our like earliest studies with Facebook and how how we thought that was so innovative. I think what we found people were sort of quite concerned initially that young people were spending a whole heap of time on um, on social media, and and that was what was promoting body image concerns. But really, it uh, we found out later it wasn't necessarily the time spent on social media; it was the activities that seemed to be potentially related to 
body image concerns and and of those it seemed to be the ones that were more image focused so looking at other people's photos taking your own photos and uploading them looking at the comments you got so you, your feedback on your appearance they they seem to be the most concerning and then obviously we moved into more of a video type platform with TikTok and Instagram reels etc so now we know it's not just the static images it's the videos as well that can lead people to be dissatisfied with their body image at least while they're using the platform yeah I found it interesting in one of your articles I think it was on the conversation uh, you said one study by Facebook of teen Instagram users in the US and UK found more than 40% of those who reported feeling unattractive said the feeling started when using Instagram. Yeah, so that was that that was back in I think 2021 and that was that that whistleblow that sort of like you know actually that Facebook now Meta they're collecting this data and they kind of know that potentially some of their users are not benefiting from from being on their platform. So I, I was really glad that that came through. I just wish there, it didn't really start up any more transparency between the social media platforms and the wider community. At least it doesn't seem to have. What was this idea of yours and, and your colleagues of make your self selfie healthy? So I suppose, uh, as we were saying, just we know that people taking their own photo can and then posting it on social media can be a pretty triggering thing. And there's so many steps that go into that. Like it's the taking of the photo. So there's like the background set up, all the lighting, the the costuming, <laughs> everything. So there's the actual photo taking. And then there's all the editing process, so um, all the filtering, that kind of stuff. And that, I I remember talking with some young people and they would say, I I set aside an entire day to take a selfie. I'm like, wow, that's that's quite a bit of time. I suppose, yeah, taking the photo, maybe going through thousands, then filtering the, the ones that they think are best and then obviously posting. So we saw that this could be potentially quite a distressing process for young people, whereas some thought it was actually really fun and selfies were a cool thing, but others found it really, really challenging and it made them sort of zoom in on all their flaws, perceived flaws. Is this fundamentally boiled down to an over-reliance on external validation? That's a, it's, what a probing question. And I think... Um, <laughs> I think we all we all have this to some extent. I just want to normalize this and I think I suppose I put my evolutionary psychology hat on and go, you know what? If we weren't getting along with the people around us in our clans, like if we weren't doing the right thing and getting positive feedback from them, we wouldn't survive. We need to have a community. We need to sort of get along with people at least to some extent to survive and flourish. So we all have this, but as you're saying, some people might not be getting that internal validation and may have an over-reliance upon external validation. And what would be the process that someone might go through to shift the balance there more towards internal validation and not feel the need to kind of spend so long curating a selfie or editing, you know, photos of themselves and manipulating them? I think there's sort of a long and a short answer to that, I think. So I'm just thinking, well, we could do years of therapy together and and (laughs) to shift your values and things like that. But I suppose the short answer would be, and something I encourage um, patients and and obviously research participants, is just um, to try and let go of the outcome of the selfie. So I suppose enjoy the process more and it's not all about the the likes and the comments. It's did I actually enjoy the process? Because that that would guide you into what where you spend your time more. I think. To what extent do you do you kind of feel like the social media apps have a duty of care here? So if I think about nutrition, which is kind of my primary area of focus, I'm I'm sort of pleased now to at least see that when information goes up on Instagram that Instagram deems as misinformation, there's often like a little warning. And I think about the the context here, what we're discussing, and I have to wonder, 
you know, should these apps, whether it's through AI or, or humans, should they be detecting if an image has been manipulated to some extent and then at least flagging and having a kind of, you know, warning or a notice below it saying uh, to those that are looking at it that this has been significantly manipulated and to keep, keep that in mind? Can I say, I wish I had done the research on this, but it has been done that when we show people that images have been edited, um, it actually doesn't alleviate body image concerns or that desire to want to look like that. So we have done that warning label research and believe me, we wanted it to work. And I think it shows that the power of the image is more more than the power of the text. And so people would say, and, and certainly when I, you know, when I interview our research participants and my patients, they, they kind of know that things are edited. So it's kind of an expectation, but that doesn't stop them from wanting to pursue these appearance ideals necessarily. What do you feel is the kind of best path forward here? And coming back to the populations most affected, I think you, you sort of um, stated that Usually this occurs early in life. So I'm, I'm assuming that's kind of the, the key population where we want to intervene in some manner to reduce that exposure. What would that look like? You're absolutely right. So it is that kind of identity formation phase, which tends to be sort of puberty, teenage, but certainly our, our body image, our sense of body image occurs from really, really early ages. So it's never too early to intervene here. And I, I mean, I wish I knew, Simon, exactly what the solution to this was on social media. Work with TikTok, work with whoever wants to work with me. I think, um, I suppose I always come at it from another perspective in that, um, of course, people can post selfies, people can can look at these beautiful images and stuff, but I've always been one who suggests having like a diverse range, probably in line of how I live my life, uh, a diverse range of interests on social media such that it's not all this really appearance-focused content. Potentially people might have even different profiles for different things, like, you know, there's nothing to stop you from setting up multiple profiles I suppose in even in that, it is putting a lot of pressure on the user, a young person whose mind is still developing. And that's, you know, they, they shouldn't be responsible for everything. I think it's it's going to take a village to, to address these kinds of issues. So it's obviously the users, their parents, carers, educators, the platforms themselves, government, et cetera, to really make that effort to see what would be the best solution and, and getting the buy-in from young people as well because I don't, I think we've sort of seen that banning things doesn't necessarily change anything um, and that's kind of I feel like a very adult perspective to go, well, just just don't do it, just don't, just don't use it. Yeah, to talk to that a little bit more because I guess there would be a lot of parents thinking, you know, I would love to help my kids navigate this terrain social media is you know probably going to be a part of their life but i don't want them to to start to have that that inner critic you know becoming very critical of their appearance potentially developing body dysmorphia uh, what what can they do so short of of banning access which you're saying is kind of self-defeating it doesn't work what can parents do here and I think it's about having conversations with your young person before before they're even at that social media age. So it's like it's starting that dialogue of of how how like social media might be used well and 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 um, enjoyably. So I'm always about yes, parents having or parents or the trusted adult in the um, in the child's life to, to be having these conversations early about how we talk about our bodies. And then how they're actually using social media. Like I think, because these days, so parents of young people, they're sort of Gen Xs and millennials as far as I can tell. So they're people who are also kind of on social media themselves. So they have some experience, but certainly not the same experience as their young person. So I'm always about having that open line of communication, sharing content between parent and child, etc. So I... 
I think it's just always about having communication about what the child's looking at. And obviously, if they're finding things distressing, um, if they're not enjoying looking at it anymore, then it's time to sort of change the feed, maybe create a new profile, those kinds of things. Much of that, I mean, that's awareness, right? Pausing. How is this, how is this leaving me feeling? You know, being aware of the kind of inner voice and the way that we talk to ourselves. Um, and I, that makes me think about the compassionate friend exercise, which I, I've seen you kind of write about. If someone hasn't heard of that, you know, what is the compassionate friend exercise and why is it really important to consider the way that we're talking to ourselves? Yeah, th- thank you for raising that. And I think that inner critic voice starts can start at a really early age, so we should be really mindful of our our little ones about how they're talking about themselves and role modeling good inner voices as adults. In terms of the compassionate friend, I suppose, and this comes from, uh, I suppose, people with eating disorders and who experience body dysmorphic disorder generally have extremely negative inner voices, particularly in relationship to their uh, appearance, but also just in general, like just their overall self-evaluation is usually very poor. And the ish, I suppose if the paradox is that they're often usually very compassionate, caring and loving towards others. So you, you sort of get them to say, you know, what's, what are you saying in your mind right now? And usually it's, it's horrible things like I'm fat, I'm ugly, I need to lose weight or I need to gain more muscle. And then you say, you know, think of who your best friend is. Would you say those things to your best friend? And they always say no because these are these are lovely people on the whole. They, they would never even think of saying those things to their best friend. And so now we say, why don't you talk to yourself like you would talk to your best friend? Yeah, it's a really beautiful exercise. Anytime we're kind of beating ourselves up in our exactly. in this our could head. be used by anyone. <laughs> It's, it is wild just thinking about this a little deeper. You mentioned before that the, the kind of warning on an image saying that this, bit, this is manipulated doesn't really change the way that people feel after seeing that image. It's, it's, it's just crazy that we know this. You know, we, we continue to compare ourselves to photos of, of people that are not even a true reflection of reality. You know, the photos are manipulated and in a sense, they are artificial, yet that inner critic, that negative inner voice still creeps in and still tells us that we're inferior. Absolutely. And I think, again, putting on my evolutionary psychology hat, so I think these comparisons are very normal. Um, We do them on lots of different uh, facets of life, but, but obviously when we're growing up, appearance is pretty key. And a key to, to finding a mate to reproduce with if we're, you know, thinking in our yeah, evolutionary roots. So if these people are your competitors and they are so far in advance of you, it's, it's of course going to make you feel bad. But as, as you said, Simon, like these are not real representations. If you met this person in real life, you'd probably go, actually, we're more on a similar level than this social media profile would suggest. Does, does p- positive self-talk work if if deep down we don't believe it? It at least gives us potentially a break from the overt negative self-talk that we're doing. And I, I've certainly heard from um, patients and clients that they have trained themselves over time. I think it's something that would take, yeah, that takes a lot of practice, particularly if you're coming from a very negative place, which people will often come from. And I suppose that's where the concept of body neutrality, which is a little bit more new, I suppose it's come around in the last couple of years, that um, sort of going from I absolutely hate my body to I absolutely love my body is a very long way and so people might be saying I'm I suppose the body neutrality is a little bit more like I'm not loving my body today but that's okay I can accept myself for what I am today so I think we need a lot more research in that body neutrality space but I I certainly with uh, my own clinical work I found that to be something more acceptable to people 
we're talking a lot about the negatives of social media. Is it all negative or has there been any research looking at social media and how it could in fact be positive for body image? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, see, I, I actually think social media is more positive than negative. I, I think it allows us to connect with people we would have never connected with otherwise. I'm just thinking of, say, someone who's LGBTIQA+, plus, who maybe lives in a, a, a regional area and doesn't really have a community and maybe wants to talk about body image concerns, they would only be able to access that probably through social media. So I think as much as it can unfortunately disseminate some negative messages, there's so much opportunity to to disseminate lots of different health campaigns via social media, including those focused on body image. You mentioned eating disorders before. What percentage of eating disorders are driven by body dysmorphia? When we talk about eating disorders, we say that over-evaluation of our weight and shape and the control of these is a, a core psychopathology. Basically, it's it's at the core of a lot of things. But I just want to acknowledge that there are, say, disorders like uh, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, ARFID. It's unfortunately what people call picky eating, but that doesn't have body image at its core. So there are eating disorders that don't have any body image concerns associated. But I suppose the ones that people are very familiar with, like anorexia and bulimia, yes, body image concerns are at the core. It's it's sort of a 100% strike rate there that people will have a negative body image that is driving a lot of the behaviours. What about orthorexia? Yes, and I, I mean orthorexia is a, another one that's not in our diagnostic manuals yet and some people would argue that orthorexia isn't a separate diagnosis, that it's it's a, anorexia of another kind. But just for, for our listeners, it tends to be sort of a focus on clean eating, quote-unquote clean I should say. And I suppose I see orthorexia commonly when someone is recovering from anorexia and they're like, hey, I know I have to eat but I'm going to eat in this very restricted, obsessive, structured way. That is where I see orthorexia pop up most commonly. And it, I, I can assure you it is <laughs> it is quite as debilitating, even though people are like, well, I'm still eating, but really it's such a limited range of foods. And if, if they deviate from that, they're just so distressed. And just the, yeah, just the obsessional way it is about something being clean or organic, yeah, it's it's pretty tricky. And body image concerns would play into that. Can orthorexia be disguised in certain circumstances as someone who is living a very healthy lifestyle and health-seeking behaviours? And I, you're absolutely right, and I think... So orthorexia, because it's not in that diagnostic manual, I think just the definition of it is still a little bit wishy-washy. And and certainly people will say, well, I, I like to eat a healthy diet. And I'm like, go right ahead. <laughs> I think where the orthorexia part kicks in is just the the obsessionality around it and the inability to deviate. So when someone eats something that's not in their meal plan, when they're asked, when they decline every dinner invitation because they don't know everything on the menu, like where they, for example, decline dinner invites because they have to be at the gym a certain number of hours. So it's, it's kind of the rigidity and the obsessionality that is the issue rather than following a healthy diet. And just in case someone's not familiar with eating disorders, what is the difference between anorexia and bulimia? Anorexia uh, typically involves uh, someone in a, a low body weight, so they are um, calorie restricted and um, they have a, a really intense fear of gaining weight. And I, I cannot understate that fear of gaining weight. That is that is what drives the restriction. There are a couple of different types of anorexia. So there's the restrictive subtype, but there's also the binge purge subtype where they will occasionally, well, they will, they'll engage in binging and vomiting, but they still have a low weight. So that's anorexia binge purge subtype. But if someone is in a normal weight body or above, and I, I hate to use the term normal weight, by the way, then that becomes a diagnosis of bulimia nervosa. So they'll be binging 
and then they will compensate, quote unquote, in some way. So it might be vomiting, laxative use, diet pills, excessive exercise. There'll be some kind of compensation. And so bulimia, yeah, bulimia is normal weight and above. Anorexia is low weight. And is it true, or I may have this this incorrect, but is it true that um, perhaps counterintuitively, eating disorders are more common in people that are overweight than underweight? Thank you so much for raising that, Simon. I'm really thrilled that you did. Yes, because <laughs> they're told that they need to lose weight and that can drive people into an eating disorder. So I've been doing some really exciting work on weight stigma recently, so basically stigmatizing people on the size of their bodies. And indeed, eating disorders are more common in larger bodied people. Is it the ESP? Is that the screening tool that is, is used to diagnose disordered eating or the most common one? I tend to use the EDEQ as our diagnostic tool, the Eating Disorder Examination Questionnaire. I know your audience is all over the world, but in Australia for our clinical cutoffs, um, whether people get support from the government for their treatment, uh, we use the EDEQ as our determination. What are the most common triggers, and I appreciate this This might overlap with some of our discussion so far and the use of social media and, and comparison, but what, what are the, the most common identified triggers that might lead to someone developing disordered eating in the first place? Yeah, and I think um, it is that interplay of genetics and, and environment again, and I, I wish we knew more about eating disorder origins because that would be really, really helpful for all of us. But certainly from, from the research, if anyone is engaging in a dieting behavior from a young age, that is that can be very, very harmful. So that caloric restriction when you're meant to be growing, that's, um, that's a big trigger. We often find that um, childhood anxiety is precedes an eating disorder. So someone with, a, I suppose, a bit more anxious temperament, they might even be um, be seeing a psychologist from a young age for anxiety. That's that's something else. Obviously, running in families, just like body dysmorphic disorder as well. So it, genetics, but also, I suppose, seeing someone else in their family experiencing an eating disorder. Yeah, so it comes back, I guess. Again, we spoke about parents and what they can do and um being a being a, a good role model in terms of how you speak to yourself, how you use social media, your, yourself in your own life, um, I have to imagine here that if a, if a child is seeing their parent, you know, spend a lot of time focusing on dietary restriction, that that might start begin to kind of rub off on them at some stage. Indeed, and. Um... We'll, we'll get parents say to us, oh, but I've never said anything negative to my child about their body and their eating, but children are like sponges and they will observe how you're eating and how you're talking about your body. And if you're talking about being on diets all the time and being dissatisfied and wanting to lose weight, then that is going to impact how they view themselves, even if you've never said anything directly. What do you think the most harmful trends are in the, the media, things that you might see in newspapers or magazines and on social media that are leading to more and more people developing disordered eating? I mean, there's so many trends, aren't there? Uh, the most recent one that's been doing the rounds is legging legs hashtag that only people with certain shaped legs can wear leggings. That's um, That's been a fun one. But I feel like people are nipping that on the bud and sort of aligning it to the, the thigh gap trend that was, oh, I suppose that's sort of a good 15, 10 to 15 years ago. But I suppose what I find really harmful, and, and people will know I'm pretty outspoken on this, and this comes from health professionals as well, is just that assumption that someone in a larger body is unhealthy. That, I think, is one of the most damaging messages ever. We actually can't tell that much from someone's weight about their health, but Obviously, if someone's in a larger body, one of the first things they'll get told by the people around them, and then if they do seek help from it from a health professional, is that they have to lose weight. That's the only solution. And we know, as we were talking about, people in larger bodies are very prone to eating disorders. So that 
that experience of weight shaming, weight stigma, being told to lose weight is really problematic. What would you like to see, I guess, change there? You know, I, I imagine that uh, a lot of that is occurring in a 15-minute sort of doctor-patient consultation. The patient is coming in with blood work. Perhaps they're getting their, a review for their medications. And it's, it's at that appointment where the doctor is kind of saying to that person that they should consider losing weight. But what, what would be an approach there that you think as a psychologist would lead to better outcomes? Basically, and we and absolutely, we know that being a doctor is a very hard job and 15 minutes is way too short. What we, what we found was that obviously that weight shaming approach really puts patients off and, and why shouldn't it? But certainly if the patient comes asking for uh, weight management support, then that should absolutely be offered and all the different options laid out on the table. And also educating patients on that their weight is is not their fault, that they shouldn't be blamed, that there are actually a lot of influences on on the size we're at, genetics, environment, sociocultural, et cetera. So, you know, our weight is not entirely within our control and um, patients really like that approach and the doctors really liked it too. I think something that we did get a bit of, I suppose, a bit, a bit of a grey zone on was, if the patient has not come in asking for weight support, weight management, should the doctor actually raise it? And again, not everyone was on the same page. They're like, nope, the patient didn't raise it. Why? It's irrelevant. They've come in for an ear infection or whatever. But then others were like, no, no, maybe it can be raised opportunistically, but in the sense of overall health. So it's not just about the number on the scale. It's like, hey, you live in your best quality life here, well, we can help you if you want to pursue this. Yeah, and I would have thought, you know, bedside etiquette might look like, you know, asking that person, are you happy to talk about your body weight? Exactly. Yes, you got it. So, but you'd be surprised at how, how this isn't done always. And sometimes I suppose doctors will often tell you about opportunistic invention, intervention. So they're like, oh, we noticed you're smoking. Would you like help with quitting smoking? And, you know, I could say, no, I'm, I'm cool with my smoking. Um, but weight management is considered an opportunistic intervention, but it's how it's done, isn't it? Yeah. And, you know, I have to I have to assume that most doctors, their intent is good. It's just that perhaps perhaps they're not deeply considering the line of questions or the things they're saying and how that can affect someone's psychology. Yeah, and that's – so I think being a psychologist – so I get to see people for 60 minutes. I get to see them far more regularly. And I get to hear about the after effects of these 15 minute consultations that have really upset people. And that was what motivated me to, to do quite a bit of this work. Um, because they've, you know, that power differential, they're very rarely going to say to their doctor, no, don't talk to me like that. That's not cool. They'll just not come back. Hey, friends. The scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12-week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. I read one of your papers that was really interesting to me. It was on dietary patterns 
and pathological eating behaviors and it compared vegans to omnivores yes and i, I want to acknowledge my p well my former phd student courtney mclean for that work Together, you guys found, and I have a quote here, that vegans displayed more pathological eating behaviors than omnivores, which was significantly predicted by cognitive restraint. However, body dissatisfaction levels were higher in omnivores than vegans. Let's unpack this a little bit. What is the significance of the link between cognitive restraint in vegans and pathological eating behaviors? Yeah, and I, you know, obviously Courtney and I have published um, quite a bit on that now and I'm not even sure we have 100% the answer now. And I think the reason that um, that she was very interested in it was that, and, and she'll tell everyone this, that she was a vegan herself and she didn't like how people assumed she sort of had an eating disorder just because she was vegan. And so Throughout the course of that body of work over the last couple of years, we saw that that certainly being vegan wasn't necessarily always linked to having an eating disorder. Some people are making these choices. And I, what we did find was that it was sort of the motivations behind the, the choice to be vegan that was crucial in, in the eating disorder risk. So if people were talking about it more from like an ethical perspective, animal rights perspective, that seemed to be less linked with eating disorders. If people were saying it was more to do with a health perspective, that was a little bit more health and weight loss. That was more linked with eating disorder pathology. If studies were looking at incidents of eating disorders in vegan populations and they weren't considering the, the motivation for the people that were adopting a vegan diet, they, they may be kind of uh, overestimating the incidence of eating disorders in vegans. Exactly. And it's to do with our eating disorder questionnaires as well. Like it's, there's some overlap in what a, a vegan would do normally, uh, but also what is an eating, um, an eating disorder symptom. So uh, that was the key to try and disentangle that. And that there's still obviously more work to be done there. But before that work, I, I was always a little bit more biased in that I was always very concerned if, if someone was coming in with a vegan diet. I was like, oh, dear, we're headed towards eating disorders. But it opened my eyes, and, and for that I'm grateful that I will always dig a bit deeper and go, oh, why? When did you start this? Did this precede the eating disorder or, or was it during? So it's, it's helped me, I think, ask better questions of patients and get a better idea of what's going on for them and their choices. Yeah, it's, it's, I find this really interesting myself because I've been working with uh, Megan Lee from Bond University. Go oh, Megan, um, a shout out to her. She's great. <laughs> yeah, and we, we also became very interested in plant-based dietary patterns and mental health outcomes. And when we were reading a lot of the research that's been done in that kind of domain not specific to eating disorders but more broad kind of anxiety depressive symptoms yes. a lot of the research is cross-sectional so as you kind of just pointed to there yes. it's not appreciating the temporal nature um, diet changes or motivation for those changes and i think yeah this this literature does suffer from unfortunately a bit of a lack of scientific rigor and I'm really glad that yourself and Megan and others are really giving it that rigor so we can disentangle these relationships. Yeah, one of the things that we're trying to do at the moment is set up a prospective study that that has that, that kind of temporality um, built into it so we can see the, you know, how, the, how outcomes change over time as people do change their, their diet. Um, did I read that you and your team kind of developed a new screening tool for eating disorders within vegan populations that considers their motivation? It is. It's, it was published in Journal of Eating Disorders um, in January 2024, so it's, it's recent compared to when we're recording this. Um, so, yes, it's, it's available if people want to use it. There's There's more validation to be done, um, but if people are keen, they can absolutely have a look at it. It's open access. Is there any clues as to why in that study, vegans and omnivores that, that you guys did, why omnivores had less body 
uh, satisfaction. I think I read that. So it was, um, yeah, omnivores had lower uh, body satisfaction, wasn't it? And the, the vegans had higher. And I think we sort of potentially thought, well, vegans are sort of valuing their bodies, what they're putting into it. I suppose we sort of looked at that kind of vegan lifestyle and potentially that was driving some of it. But um, our data couldn't tell us exactly. But I think that's what we surmised. What are the the the, the best evidence based practices today that we kind of have at our fingertips for treating eating disorders? Yeah, and you know, it is expanding, which is great, but um, I think there's a lot more to be done in this space. So generally, it's always recommended that eating disorders be treated by a multidisciplinary team. So that has the 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 GP, the psychologist, the dietitian, the psychiatrist. I should say pediatrician for our, our younger folks. So so that I suppose all facets are are covered off on. And generally speaking, family-based therapy is um, considered best for for children and adolescents. And then from an adult perspective and with my psychologist hat on, um, it's cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced or CBTE is considered the gold standard treatment. And so people will be seeing their psychologists very regularly, um, you know, once, twice a week sometimes. Um, and the first step of it is really just that behavioral change, just trying to get regular eating initiated because of, often people are sort of not eating for big periods of the day and then binging. And then we look more at the, I suppose, psychological aspects, the body image concerns, the overall self-evaluation. But um, you have to you focus on behaviors first. What's the kind of typical success rate of that gold standard treatment if you take a hundred people that have um, eating disorders how how what what percentage of people are able to overcome that eating disorder and then resume healthy eating behaviors yeah I mean there, there's a few different figures on that and I suppose I've seen relapse rates of up to 30 percent in in some of this research I mean other studies will find other numbers. So it's certainly not a hundred percent successful. And I think something that I'm very passionate about is understanding the biology or the biological mechanisms of eating disorders better. Because I think pharmacologically, we really haven't done enough in this space. Um, so in the moment in Australia, we only have one medication for eating disorders that's TGA approved, and that's uh, Vyvanse, um, an amphetamine. And that really, I mean, goodness gracious me, that's not really that good. So I think there are a lot of avenues still to explore along with the psychology, psychiatry, dietetic support that would allow people to have much better recovery rates, potentially. In that space, are there other drug targets um, or certain pharmaceuticals that you're kind of thinking of that would target different areas of the brain? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think there are some really promising trials coming through. So particularly um, psychedelics, psilocybin in particular for anorexia. So I think what uh, what I've learned so far, and I should say I'm, I'm doing the training course right now, so I'm super excited about that, is that psychedelics can potentially allow people's minds to open up when they're previously kind of locked down and rigid and maybe be more open to to a kind of psychological therapy experience. So that's that's certainly one avenue. Um, and I, I I've got to be controversial here and talk about Ozempic, which which is um, on everyone's radar. And I think like I am not opposed to to people using uh, these medications uh, as indicated. So um, Ozempic is a GLP one receptor agonist. And there's lots more coming out now. So Ozempic was just kind of the first wave, really. But I would like to see, and I think the studies are running right now, but how does um, semaglutide or GLP-1 receptor agonists, can they help with binge eating disorder? So we know that it can obviously lower weight. It can help with diabetes. But does it actually help with binge eating disorder behaviours and the cognitions? So I'm, I'm excited to see that there's more coming through at least. And the flip side of, of that also related to Ozempic, I read 
an opinion piece, I think it was, of yours that you you published that was kind of emphasizing perhaps the importance of screening for eating disorders before prescribing Ozempic. Can you kind of unpack that for us? Indeed. So because Ozempic has that really powerful weight loss ability, and I mean, it's, it's you know, the, the, we've got the best drugs now ever if you want to lose weight, but, but clearly um, weight and shape dissatisfaction are very core to eating disorders. And I'm, I'm just thinking of people who are, you know, in that normal weight range or even low weight range, if they were to get their hands on this, it would actually probably be a, a, quite a bad outcome because they are already normal or low weight and it would for potentially further perpetuate their eating disorder. And I think, you know, people have been doing this for years with diet pills and, and stuff like that. So Ozempic could potentially be used as a tool like that. What do you think about AI and whether this can help the treatment of eating disorders? I, I think I come in with a very biased opinion, but um, I'm, of course, very happy to to talk about AI and eating disorders. So it's a a topic that I've been very interested in for about six years now. And I think the um, the reason I even got into it was that it was already being used uh, in suicide prevention. And I thought, well, why can't we um, harness the power of AI uh, in, in eating disorders? And I suppose my first foray into AI, which has now expanded, thankfully, uh, was conversational AI agents or chatbots because I, I saw that uh, Lifeline had a, a chatbot and it seemed to be helping to shoulder the load a little bit of, of their um, helpline service. And I thought, well, why can't we do this for eating disorders? And, and that's where our very first chatbot came into play. I mean, it, it took years and I think people are pretty sceptical of AI, even more so now. Um, but certainly back then people had their concerns. They're like, you know, what if AI gets it wrong? What if it doesn't help someone? What if they harm themselves? And they were all very, very valid questions. And in response to that, we started out at a very, very low level of AI um, that really, I suppose, couldn't couldn't do much thinking for itself. It was all very much pre-programmed and that's how we ensured safety initially. But um, certainly with progression in AI, particularly the last couple of years, and I know all your your listeners will have heard of chat GPT and generative AI, we now have much more scope to do a lot more in helping people with treatment with AI. We know that we'll never have enough human health professionals to do what's needed. We need to be able to look better at the data and be able to do better clinical decision making. So there's, I suppose, a lot of uses of AI now that we're exploring more, thankfully. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's interesting that you raise that. I had uh, Stephen Bright on my show a couple of weeks ago and uh, prior to that, Susan Rossell, um, both both speaking to our community here about psychedelics and mental health. And one of the things that came up with Stephen when we were talking about reducing drug-related harm was the there's a bottleneck that he was describing whereby it's hard to get enough uh, registered kind of psychologists out there in the field. Um, so uh, only you know, only a small number of the people, this is my understanding of it, that actually graduate with a psychology degree are then able to go and get the further qualifications that, that are needed to kind of practice clinically. And, and he was describing this bottleneck of kind of senior supervisors or advisors that are needed for that. And one of the questions or things that I, I sort of posed to him was, could AI kind of maybe step in and help alleviate that bottleneck? I, uh, what was his answer, by the way? <laughs> I'm not sure it was something that he had given a lot of thought to, but, um, you know, it seems to me that technology kind of used in that way might lead to more access. So a lot of what we're talking about here, um, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming it's similar with eating disorders, is getting people more access to good advice. Exactly, that evidence-based advice because there's such 
terrible advice in other areas of the internet. I agree. There's there's the opportunity to fill gaps in treatment. And I think also um, AI has the opportunity to help upskill professionals as well. So training, chatbots. Um, so I, I think it, it can be both sides because Unfortunately, um, eating disorders are considered a, a specialist area of mental health, even though they're extremely prevalent. And so if we can upskill uh, across the health professional spectrum more easily, then all the better. How prevalent are these these conditions again? About 4% of the population is, is what I have read and, and probably have, have a great underestimate really um, of, of what's actually going on. Are there any myths that we haven't covered, perhaps things uh, in the media or the way the media portray eating disorders um, that you would like to clear up? I I mean, it's probably a a 12-hour podcast there, Simon, so I won't do that. I'll just pick out some. But, I mean, I, I am so glad that anorexia is on people's radar, but I think the other eating disorders really get left off and I... I feel like there was a bunch of Lifetime movies in the 90s with like, you know, Caucasian white teen girls with anorexia and everyone's like, well, that's it. That's that's what an eating disorder is. Or Karen Carpenter, for example, you know, uh, may she rest in peace. Um, so I think there is still a lot of a stereotyping of what a, an eating disorder looks like. So only girls, only young, only white. And something that really bothers me as well is uh, only high socioeconomic status. That is so not right. Um, it is just that these are the people who can afford to come to treatment. <laughs> these are not everyone. This is just probably the tip of the iceberg. I'm sure if others could afford to come to treatment, they would. That's eating disorders and we kind of established that that can often be downstream of body dysmorphia. What about exercise? Are there are there harmful exercise behaviours that come from negative body image and what do they look like? I mean, I think we, we do include them in our eating disorder diagnoses, so we have them in there and I think I suppose it's what puts a lot of athletes at risk of eating disorders, sadly, when they're just pursuing what they love doing. I suppose in um, in anorexia, in bulimia and in other eating disorders, we talk about excessive or driven exercise and we always scream for this. And so it means that um, things like if someone was to miss an exercise session, they would likely feel very, very distressed. If someone was injured, they would still exercise. Even if it makes the, the injury worse, they would still still do it. It may take up hours and hours of their day, meaning that they can't do other things. I suppose that's that's why we call it driven because it's just it's such a compulsive behaviour. And the exercise can take any form. It could be going to the gym. It could be running, walking, rowing, cycling. Um, all of those um, exercises can be done to excess. And we know that it can definitely cause a lot of injury. How do we separate this from the athlete that is just extremely competitive and, and driven to succeed in, in whatever sport or athletic endeavor they have. Um, when, when, does, when does it cross the line from just being extremely driven towards a goal versus something that is, would be deemed as a kind of negative behavior for someone's psychology? Yeah. And it's, it, believe me, it's such a slippery slope and, and I, I mean, any athlete will tell you, I mean, I suppose with female athletes, we, we kind of know if they stop menstruating that, that that is really a problem. And I know coaches are much more aware of that now, which is really, really good. But I've certainly worked with people who, so people get into sport because they, you know, they enjoy it and they have these goals of getting to the Olympics or whatever they're aiming for. And what we find is that when the eating disorder become so severe they actually don't really care about that anymore it's all about the eating disorder so if you're seeing someone who's like 
actually, it's just about the number on the scale. I couldn't care if I dropped a second in the 400 metre run. Like that's that's when it's got problematic, when it just, it's yeah, it's all about the weight, shape and control and less about their sporting goals. Which makes me think and and you know this this is rather obvious but given what you just said then about all about the weight and shape i imagine that this has to be very prevalent in the kind of bodybuilding and fitness modeling circles with those areas it's considered really normative and not pathological and and so you don't often see them come for treatment which you know they would benefit from most likely but yeah, it's just like, well, of course I'm going to dehydrate myself for days to look really shredded or, you know, of course I'm going to abuse diuretics to get to a certain weight class or, of course, I'm going to take steroids to to look like this, whereas we know that it can be really dangerous. How can someone break that cycle? If they're there right now, that's that's where their psychology is and they're in it, they want to get out, but it seems impossible. Yeah, I'm glad you said they want to get out because it means that they've at least thought about it. Like I think if someone doesn't think it's a problem, then it's it's extremely difficult. But if someone is in that cycle and considering changing their ways, that I'm really glad for them first up that they've at least sort of gone, hey, I don't want to keep living like this. It's going to be really hard for them to do it by themselves. And I think probably the first thing is just booking an appointment with their GP or maybe even before that, just talking to someone they trust uh, just to because they might not have spoken to anyone about it. Um, and so just going, okay, I, I want to start seeking help for this. And their GP, I suppose in Australia we have um, Butterfly Helpline as our national service for body image concerns and eating disorders. And I think... Unfortunately, because it's hard to get treatment, some people may really want to get treatment much quicker and then they've waited so long, by the time they get it, they're feeling quite ambivalent and that's a huge problem. And I suppose bringing back to AI, AI can potentially help to fill that gap and we're doing that research. But I suppose I, my, I would love that if someone wanted treatment, that they could get it much sooner because that motivation can really wax and wane. So just to clarify something here, are we talking about this kind of obsession with exercise and with how you're eating being a problem to the extent or when and if it affects your psychology negatively? So if someone's listening and they're thinking, gosh, I'm so dedicated to training in the gym, I'm dedicated to eating well, it's a part of my lifestyle, but I feel feel happy. Is that the distinguishing factor here, how you feel about your life? I think you're absolutely right that like um, how it impacts your life is really crucial. And I think if someone's, (laughs) I suppose what I also see though, just putting my clinical hat on is that people think it could be going really well for them. They're like, hey, my eating disorder is going great. (laughs) Like this is, I've never felt better. Um, Whereas we know that they're quite unwell. So I I do wonder about sort of a lack of insight at times. But I think if you said to someone, I don't know, the the gym is going to be closed for a week, (laughs) would that be like absolutely the end of the world for them? If not, then that's probably fine. (laughs) Or if they didn't have access to a certain food for a little while, is that going to be okay? If it is, cool, keep on going. Um, Because I know that I I completely appreciate um, what you and others would say in this space that, of course, we want people to exercise and and eat healthily. That's what everyone aims for. And I think the vast majority of people are, are doing that and enjoying themselves and not damaging themselves in any way. What about cosmetic interventions? Is this is this also something that a lot of people are, are turning to with low body image and, and perhaps other mental health conditions? Yes, I, I love chatting about this. So I think what we have seen in the last, I suppose, 10 years or so is a quite a big upswing in people accessing things like Botox and fillers. Uh, so they're what we call non-invasive cosmetic procedures as opposed to invasive procedures, which are things like breast augmentation, nose jobs, where there's um, actual cutting of the skin. 
So in terms of the, I suppose, the invasive ones we've seen, yeah, they, they go up a little bit in popularity, but the, yeah, the huge interest has been in those injectables, the Botox and the fillers, and just being able to get it at your like local shopping center. <laughs> just, you know, ah, I'm going to nip down to Coles uh, for our Australian listeners as a supermarket um, and uh, get some bread, but maybe I'll get some Botox as well. Like just the accessibility is is so high now that it's um that it's become rather mainstream and is the incidence of mental health conditions within this population so people that are seeking non-invasive or invasive cosmetic interventions is that incidence on par with general population or is it higher and you know i I wish like the research in this field is a bit patchy because some some studies will say that there is absolutely no difference in mental health status of people who are seeking surgery versus those who are not. And really the only difference is that these people are concerned about a particular area of their body that they're getting operated on anyway. I suppose in my research I've, I've found sometimes that they have a bit of a lower quality of life, um, maybe a bit more anxiety, depression, maybe they have body dysmorphic disorder. So in, in my research there, there has been a difference between the general population. But again, I suppose it depends on who you're using as your control group in these studies and that's, you know, a matter of debate as well. I know you've spent quite a bit of time thinking about screening for body dysmorphic disorder prior to cosmetic interventions. How satisfied are patients who have body dysmorphic disorder after a cosmetic procedure? Yeah, I mean, this is, again, where the literature can be quite diverse. Back in the day, we uh, used to think that body dysmorphic disorder was this massive contraindication that if people with body dysmorphic disorder had cosmetic procedures, they felt worse, more likely to sue the person who performed the procedure, sometimes in terrible cases killed the treating practitioner um, or hurt themselves. So it was always just terrible outcomes. But I suppose in in my research most recently, and I do wonder if these are people who might not even have body dysmorphia, maybe it is just negative body image, they actually felt better and they lost their diagnosis. So it's not clear cut. And I, again, probably speaks to a bit of a wishy-washy definition of body dysmorphia. I mean, imagine if we had a genetic marker and could just tell exactly who they were, it'd be so much easier. I suppose body dysmorphic disorder is the is the one disorder that cosmetic surgeons tend to look out for. But in in my research I, and my clinical practice, I'm encouraging people to look out for more than just that. Like there there are other things that can lead to someone having a bad outcome. You've stated, and I have a quote here: "Not enough is being done to ensure the psychological safety of people requesting cosmetic procedures." So, in your view, what what should be done that is different to, to what's happening today? I, I honestly think we are taking steps forward, which is really, really good. Um, in my mind, it should be mandated for any cosmetic procedure. People will say that's that's too much, it's too much level of governance. But I just honestly think that if we compare it to, say, like bariatric surgery, heart surgery, they all have psychologists as part of the team. It's just absolutely routine. So I I just think it's bringing it into line with every other area of medicine, really, where there's going to be a significant life change. Playing devil's advocate here, my understanding, with at least with a lot of the non-invasive procedures, is that, uh, you know, as you said, they're so accessible now. You can find them in the local shopping center and and often are not carried out by doctors or nurses and so if you made it mandatory to do a a psych evaluation with a psychologist before a non-invasive procedure i think that would really hurt the bottom line of a lot of these businesses i i'm just not sure about people who aren't doctors and nurses giving injectables that really worries me so much like would you go get your covid vaccine from your hairdresser like you just you just wouldn't okay it, these people have been trained to give these injections and aftercare so i that's an, a whole another area of regulation and 
And I suppose as part of their training, doctors and nurses are given some, at least some input on mental health. So it's not such a, a bridge too far for them. Like they, they should be asking these questions anyway. Potentially, it doesn't have to be every single time they come for their fillers or Botox because we know that, you know, this can be done every six months, for example. But I would think a new, a new patient should probably have this done. And this might be another area where AI can kind of be uh, of help. I, I, want, I want to retire. So, yes, I'm all for it. What is the risk if appropriate screening isn't done? And someone with body dysmorphic disorder is undergoing a cosmetic treatment. Yeah, so, and I should say that these people are in the minority anyway, because I, I do these assessments, I, I sh- at least I used to do them quite routinely. The risk is, I suppose, that they are dissatisfied and they go back for more and more and more procedures. They, they doctor shop, they litigate against the treating practitioner because they didn't deliver what they wanted. They, they hurt themselves. Unfortunately, um, body dysmorphic disorder has a really high suicide rate. Um, so there's sort of harm for themselves, the, the health service that provided it. There's a lot of things that could go wrong. So are you against all cosmetic procedures? It sounds like you're not totally against them. No, no, not at all. Because <laughs> I, I tell you, the vast majority of the screenings that I do, it's like, yep, go ahead. Sounds sounds like you've thought this through, and you know, you know, you you understand the limitations it would have on improving your life, um, those kinds of things. So, no, I'm I'm certainly not. And I have always been someone who's worked a lot with people in the cosmetic industry, and I I praise everyone who's been open to working with me. Um, because often psychologists are seen as skeptics. So, no, I and, and the vast majority of people have a really good outcome. Um, you know, they, they get their nose job done and that's it. They don't have any more procedures the rest of their lives. So, no, definitely not against it. And I'm really glad to see there's a bit more tighter regulation going on in Australia at least. Quick one, folks. I get asked all the time about buying supplements and getting blood tests. The good news is I've created comprehensive and completely free guides for both. Simply head over to my website, theproof.com, to download them. That's theproof.com. Okay, let's get back to the episode. I was surprised in kind of researching for this episode to learn about the rise in labiaplasty and penile augmentation. These are probably new terms for many of the listeners. For someone that is completely new here to this, perhaps we could start by explaining what labiaplasty and penile augmentation are. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, I've been called labia lady for, I reckon, about 10 years now because uh, I did my PhD on this. So it's, a, it's a, you know, something I've loved for a long time. Labiaplasty, I should say, I think the, the numbers are leveling off a little bit with labiaplasty, but there certainly was a huge increase there for a while. So labiaplasty is the reduction of the inner vaginal lips, known as the labia minora. And uh, some people have nicknamed it the Barbie doll surgery because Barbie doesn't really have any visible external genitalia. Uh, so people are sort of wanting a kind of smooth, smooth pubic mound look. Yes, it certainly was popular there, at least in the 2010s. And in terms of penile augmentation, so that can mean a lot of different things. I suppose the two main are sort of lengthening and thickening. There's a lot of interesting types of surgery going on, and I should say none of them are evidence-based. The particular type of penile augmentation that I've done a lot of research on is is girth enhancing and through fillers. So it's the same type of fillers you'd get put into your face, you can put them into the penis. So with women, it's they're getting tissue chopped off, and for men, it's that they're enhancing their genitalia. What was it that popularized labioplasty, you know, in the early 2000s. And I think another term that kind of gets thrown around and maybe you used it in a TED, in your TED talk was designer vagina. Yeah, that's, you know, I'm not sure exactly what it was um, that 
that caused that significant upswing. I mean, people will say, oh, you know, because of one Sex in the City episode, everyone started removing all their pubic hair and then they could see their labia minora and they didn't like how it looked. And then a surgeon was like, oh, I can help you with that. I think, I mean, obviously a lot of different factors, uh, pornography, uh, obviously becoming more accessible, people not relying upon dodgy dial-up internet so they could actually watch more pornography. As I mentioned, pubic hair removal, a lot of more sheer fashions as well, so things like leggings, yoga pants, that kind of stuff where people might see if someone has a larger labia minora. Yeah, they, they just seem to be this this genital ideal that that didn't really exist before for women um, probably just a whole combination of factors. Is that part of the vulva, the labia minora? Is that an important tissue? Is it kind of needed for any particular reason? Yeah, it, it is, and, and um, I'm sure we're finding out more and more things about it, but um, certainly uh, sexual arousal and lubrication it's important um, but also just um, so uh, when women urinate the labia minora make sure that the urine goes in like a particular stream that it doesn't just spray everywhere um, and also the labia minora protects the the vaginal opening against any um, I suppose um, potential foreign bodies infections that kind of stuff. Is there any long-term data with regards to the outcome so obviously there's the kind of more immediate uh, outcomes how women feel about themselves afterwards but also the longer term outcomes around arousal and lubrication and satisfaction with sex etc i wish i'd seen like something like 10 years post um and also sort of women who are having it in their 20s, I wonder what happens during menopause. So I wonder if we're hitting some of that data now. I hope someone's doing that research. I wish I was doing it. In, in menopause, that tissue tends to atrophy anyway. So if you don't really have much of it, what, what happens then? Um, and certainly we saw that if people had had um, labiaplasty, they were opting for caesarean births so that the vaginal canal wasn't... Um, I suppose, damaged in any way. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I'm not exactly sure. They tend to report greater sexual satisfaction, but I always think these are people who who may have been very self-conscious, not even able to have any sexual partners. So the surgery is like, well, at least I can have a sexual partner now. Like it's just, um, it's opened up an, an avenue for them that they may not have had before. But, I, yeah, I do wonder about the actual sexual functioning part. And is the main motivation for women to undergo labiaplasty appearance, you know, from, from porn like you mentioned before and society, culture, uh, movies, uh, Barbie, et cetera, uh, or is it also to do with how it feels? Yeah, and, and certainly when we ask women this, it – it usually comes under a couple of categories. Appearance might be top rated, but function is is coming a very close second. They'll say absolutely they don't like the look of it, but they'll also say it's difficult to manage with toileting. Uh, maybe it hurts when they go bike riding, like on the bike seat, horse riding, maybe when they wear certain types of underwear. So it, I think it's quite hard to disentangle that. I think once you don't like the appearance of something, you, you'll notice the function of it more and vice versa. So I think it kind of becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. And I, I suppose it just, just while I have the platform, I'm just like, well, can't we change like bike seats to suit labia instead of chopping off labia? But anyway, if any, if any bike producers are out there, come, come chat with me. Educate me, uh, us. What's the difference between vagina and vulva? anatomically vagina really is just that sort of um inner canal um where obviously babies babies are birthed out of where um, a penis and other um items can be inserted so the vagina is really just the inner bit whereas the vulva is kind of the whole outer bit so the the lips the labia majora labia minora the um part of the clitoris is on the outside so so yeah it's um people will use them interchangeably but they're quite different and you did a study uh, with 
343 girls looking at educating teenage girls about the anatomy of their genital region. Can you, what can you tell us about the, the study design, what, what inspired it and kind of what the, the main take-home messages were? Yeah, I'm, I've actually read that paper recently because we're, we've uh, just made an intervention for people with a penis. So we're, we're going across the gender spectrum there. Um, so that was a 2019, 2020 study. Uh, shout out to my um, former honor student and now research assistant, Nalashni Fernando for that. Uh, so we just, we kind of knew that there was this educational piece missing that, that women didn't really know the, um, the anatomical terms. And they certainly really hadn't seen many other women's vulvas. And um, we took the opportunity really to, to make this short video that um, talked about diversity, that challenged that Barbie doll look and encouraged women to embrace their genital anatomy and using the correct terminology. And we found that it actually was really successful, which was great. Like you always hope for these things, but certainly in the 16 to 18 year olds who we surveyed, uh, it did help improve their appearance satisfaction, lowered their um, interest in labiaplasty and improved their knowledge quite a lot. So that was with teenage girls. Is, is that where the increased incidence or interest, I should say, in labiaplasty uh, is coming from that that population, or is it older women? So that that population doesn't usually have the financial means, but that can certainly be when appearance concerns start. They might be starting to have relationships and maybe comments from sexual partners. So it it is a good age group to target. But in terms of those actually accessing labiaplasty, it's more like sort of early to mid-20s. And then there's another pocket of women, um, generally sort of 35 plus, who may have usually had children and are looking for some kind of rejuvenation. Do we need to, as a society, uh, get more comfortable? talking about vulvas, vaginas, penises, and kind of just making that entire conversation less taboo? I, I would love that. And certainly that's been um, something I've petitioned for for a long time. I think I don't actually think we're that uncomfortable talking about penises and testicles and, and generally the people who own them know their terminology, know their functions, but certainly um, vulvas, vaginas, not so much. Although I do... I wonder if there has been a bit of a trend of people being a bit more open about this. I hope so. I think some people have concerns, and you may agree with me here or, or not, that discussing sexual organs, particularly with young people, is not appropriate. Is is that kind of avoidance of the topic, is that contributing to shame and embarrassment that a young person may experience? Uh, yes, I, I think so. And I certainly, I mean, young people will ask these questions. Like you'll get three-year-olds who, you know, they're taking a bath with a sibling and they'll go, why does theirs look different? The questions are being asked already. And if you don't answer them, then the child really has no uh, no other, I suppose, um, understanding than to think, oh, this is embarrassing, this is shameful, my parent or whoever it is won't even answer my question. Someone needs to write a manual for parents with age-appropriate <laughs> ways to answer these questions. I think these these resources absolutely do exist and I, I'm a firm believer in using the correct, te- the correct terminology from the get-go. Like, you know, don't use foo-foo or flower or whatever for for vaginas, please, um, you know, use use the correct term. You wouldn't say uh, thingamajiggy instead of arm and, you know, finger sausages or whatever for hand or, you know, it, it, they need to be used correctly. And I suppose something that isn't so talked about is, and unfortunately this is a, this is a reality, that um, young people who, who know about their private parts, they know about the names, et cetera, 
it seems that they are far less likely to be sexually abused um, because they know their bodies, they know their body autonomy. They've already had that conversation with their parents about these parts so they can say so-and-so is touching my parts. So this, is, this isn't this is just a, a fun thing. This is like your child's safety. Mm, yeah, that's really important. Thanks for adding that. I, I paused on one of the quotes you had from a girl that was in that study. I think you asked for some some recommendations and part of what she had to say was explaining to females that they should not be concerned with their genital appearance appearance and educating boys and girls not to comment on women's genitals and that gets me thinking about the role of partners here yes are there things that partners may be saying that they're unaware of of the consequences that that language may have that could be leading to their partner exploring cosmetic genital surgery. Indeed. And I think, I mean, any of these appearance comments can be really detrimental. Um, and I think because um, sex is is generally, it doesn't have to be a, a really intimate thing and, you know, you're sort of sharing it with someone, you might trust, might have some affection for, um, these these comments really do hurt and they and people aren't usually getting a lot of feedback on their genital appearance. So if you've had one comment and it's negative, it's it's not great. Just quickly before we kind of wrap up here, you mentioned penile augmentation and you you spoke to the procedure that's commonly done is, kind of non-invasive, the use of fillers to increase girth. Is there is there any research looking at what's motivating men to do this? Is it culture and society or is it their, their partners um, and their desires? Uh, I tell you, it's all of the above when we do these um, studies with men. So... Certainly that self-esteem, self-confidence, sense of masculinity is driving a lot of it, a desire to have a more satisfying sex life for themselves and their partners. We do hear comments about teasing from sexual partners, uh, but also that broader societal narrative of a bigger penis is the best penis I think we find that, yeah, when we ask men these questions, it's quite a diverse range of answers. I'm sure there's been research looking at at this, but when it comes to sexual preferences, what do we understand about the average woman or man and their preference for penis size? Is it average? Is it above average, below average? What do we understand about that? Oh, gosh. I mean, this is such an interesting area of research and I wish I'd done more in it and I wish we'd all done more research in it. But I suppose the the research that I commonly cite in terms of women's preferences for, for a penis size, so it depends on the type of engagement. So if it's a, a sort of one-night stand or a very short-term relationship, um, a bigger penis can be preferred, and I think because it's considered a bit novel. <laughs> but in terms of a long-term um, satisfying relationship, average is great. So that's I'm sure there's more research to be done there, but that's um, that's – the findings that I tend to cite. Yeah, I wonder the percentage of men that are going in for penile augmentation, what percentage of them are looking for relationships versus one-night stands. That, that's some interesting research potentially. Yeah, I, you know, I, I I did not ask that. I should have. I <laughs> I remember just um, being a very fresh psychologist to <laughs> doing these interviews and I – I would do them differently now, but uh, it certainly was an excellent experience at the time. How successful are these penile augmentation procedures? Yeah, so in the penile augmentation procedure that I've done the most work on using um, filler uh, that's commonly used in the face as well and to to increase girth size, men are generally pretty satisfied. Of course, they wish it was a more permanent solution, but um, so they generally have to come back every sort of 18 months or so to to get top-ups. 
sometimes they're not that happy with the aesthetic outcome. It can sometimes come out a little bit lumpy um, as, as filler settles in different bits, but generally speaking, they're pretty satisfied. And this is in comparison to surgical lengthening uh, procedures, which are very much experimental and have, can have some really serious side effects. Um, sometimes people not being able to get erections anymore, really quite um, unappealing aesthetic outcomes. Uh, so the, I suppose the, the filler version that I look at has, has quite a high level of satisfaction in comparison. And potentially not reversible, I imagine. Exactly. So whereas, uh, you know, you can dissolve filler, <laughs> but um, if you've, you know, cut a ligament to make the penis look longer, yeah, sorry, you're, you're done, sadly. Ouch. What would you like people to, to think about before doing labiaplasty or penile augmentation or what kind of questions would you want people to be asking, exploring? Yeah, and I think I would give this same advice to anyone seeking a cosmetic procedure is, you know, do you know exactly what the procedure entails? Do you know the person's safety record with this type of procedure? What if something goes wrong? Where can you go? What is the aftercare going to be like? Yeah, who can you get support from, um, both from a health professional perspective but also in your, your own social network if you need some help with things after having the procedure? And I suppose the area that I'm really interested in is sort of why are you getting this procedure and what do you hope to get out of it? And I really enjoy having conversations with people who are seeking procedures to work through that. You know, is the procedure actually the best thing for them right then or is it doing some other kind of work, um, other kind of psychological work first? And, yes, obviously, are your expectations realistic for afterwards? You're like, okay, I'm going to have a um, larger penis. So I'll be like, okay, yeah, that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, but is it like I'm going to get a supermodel girlfriend and be able to buy a Ferrari? Um, maybe maybe not quite so realistic. Gemma, thank you so much for joining us today and being so gracious with your time. Um, and thank you for your incredible contribution to science and bettering humanity it's really important work that you're doing so we all really appreciate it yes thank you so much for having me it's not often that i get to reflect on my body of research like this so um it's been really fun and thinking back about studies that are sort of you know eight years old versus studies that are in progress so it, it's been really fun thank you yeah and i should add the, the listeners know this, but any of the studies we've spoken about or articles you've written on, on the conversation or other websites that we referred to, all of those along with your Monash University profile, I think it is, they'll all be in the show notes. There you have it, friends. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did and want to stay up to date with future episodes, be sure to hit that subscribe button on YouTube and follow on Apple or Spotify. Finally, thank you for showing up and the effort that you're making to take control of your health. I look forward to hanging out with you again in the next episode.